as you can see, this poem is about a loaf of bread. So simple. No, of course it's not about a loaf of bread. Since when was a poem ever simple? It's about so much more than a loaf of bread. You thought you could get away with something easy. No, let's go and uh, squeeze some meaning out of this poem. So we'll start off by just looking at what the poem is on a basic level. Let's start with the simple stuff. If you were doing this poem in grade eight, what it would be doing is it would be asking you to look at the ordinary things that are around you, like a loaf of bread or a cup of coffee or some sugar or a jersey that you're wearing, and think about where those things came from. And everything that we use on a daily basis obviously has had a long journey of being manufactured and produced. And so the portrait that is being referred to here is what are all of the things that go into creating this end product that we end up with? That's a, that's the that's the understanding of this poem on a very simple level. Just look at the journey of the of this particular thing. Of course, this is English and we're not in grade eight, we're in matric. So we have to wring a little bit more meaning out of this particular poem. So we'll do what we usually do. We'll go into the, the, the poem and we'll unpack it verse by verse. Before we start, of course, I don't think I need to point out to you the fact that the poem is written by a, a black South African poet. And of course, you whenever that is the case, then you know that there's going to be some underlying contextual reference to the South African situation. So that, that goes without saying. But let's take a look at the poem from a verse by verse basis. Luckily, there's only three verses, so this will be really short. Look back to the rolling fields, waving gold topped wheat stalks, mowed by the reaper's scythe, bundled into sheaves, carted to the mill and ground into flour kneaded into mountains of dough to be churned by rollers and spat into pans as red hot as satan's cauldron brought to the cafe warmly wrapped in cellophane by eat fresh bread bakery van for the waiting cook to slice and toast to butter and to marmalade for the food bedecked breakfast table whilst the laborer with fingers caked with wet cement of a builder's scaffold, mauls a hunk and a cold drink and licks his lips and laughs. Man can live on bread alone. So you can see here that what you've got in terms of the description of the poem is really simple. The, the, the wheat, we start with the, the fields of wheat where they're growing and they're being harvested. That then gets processed into the flour, gets ground up at the mill and, and made into flour, which then gets kneaded into dough and, and, and baked into the bread and then gets transported to the end point where it finally gets consumed in the form of bread by you, the consumer. You could, you could apply this, I mean, this is like geography grade five, isn't it? You know, like where do things come from? That's, that's all that the poem is about. But of course, the starting point of this particular item is not the same as the end point. So I'll start with the first verse because that's that's where everything starts. And then you're going to see that in the second and the third verse, there's a contrast created between the two places where this loaf of bread might end up. So in the first verse, the first two, the first instruction that you have there is to is to look back. The that's an instruction to the reader to see where your bread came from. Obviously, you're sitting with the bread right in front of you. So in order to know where the bread came from, you've got to look into the past and examine where it might have come from. And if you look back far enough, you're going to get to the rolling fields of wheat. The first two lines are, are the a reference uh, is like the nature part of the poem. OK, that's like the man hasn't really had much to do at that point. It's just the wheat growing. I mean, obviously, he sowed the seeds and stuff. But here you've got the wheat the rolling fields and the waving gold top wheat stalks. If you notice, you'll see that there's a distinction between the verbs in the first two lines and all the other verbs in the rest of this stanza. So the first two lines contain my favorite thing, present participles, rolling fields and waving gold topped wheat stalks. What do present participles indicate? I'm not even gonna tell you, you should know by now. So that's the nature side of things. And then the rest of the poem moves into the more man-made side of things. Everything else is once the, the wheat has been um, harvested, it gets progressively uh, processed and manufactured. And there's just a whole series of things that happen to it. It gets mowed and bundled and carted and ground and 
kneaded and churned and spat, lots and lots of, of verbs there, lots of things happening. So, so observe the progression there from the, the, the sort of the, the peaceful, natural world into the man-made element of processing. Um, just a little note, I haven't actually indicated it on the slide, but pay attention to the alliteration in the last two lines of the stanza, spat into pans, as red hot as Satan's cauldron. A little bit of a alliteration on the S sound there to imitate that sound of, uh, you know, maybe what um, something cold makes when it gets thrown into something really hot. If you are not certain what a scythe is, by the way, um, a scythe is the thing that you would reap with. You've, you've probably all seen it. It's usually what they depict a grim reaper using, but that would have been what, what the reaper would have reaped with. This is obviously a poem referring back to, uh, you know, a previous time. We don't use size anymore. We use combine harvesters, not nearly as rural and idyllic. And of course, sheaves are just the bound things of wheat. The, the only real major thing I think that you can notice in, in this stanza is that contrast between all of the activity and the energy of what goes on. Um, and it's interesting that it's written in the passive voice. I mean, I suppose it has to be written in the passive voice, but it does it does generate a little bit of, of contrast between wh who's doing it and what's happening. There's, we don't need to know who's doing it. We just need to know all of the things that are happening to this, this wheat. And that's where it all starts. When we move into the second and the third stanzas, or the, the last two stanzas, we see a contrast between the two places that it ends up, okay? On the one hand, it gets brought to a cafe where it gets sliced up and, and buttered and toasted and added to a whole lot of other lovely things on a, on a beautiful breakfast table. But on the other hand, it ends up in a much simpler situation with the laborer and the bread. So look at the contrast between these two stanzas. The one side definitely indicates that this is a wealthy consumer, if you want to call it that. I mean, it even there's even a cook that is that is there's an additional person cooking this, and on the other side, it's quite clearly not not nearly as wealthy. There's a whole air of of elegance here created by the fact by the descriptions here. I mean, look at where it is. First of all, it's in a cafe. Now, a cafe. Certainly in South Africa, cafes used to be places where you would go and sit down and have a cup of tea and a scone maybe or something like that. They were fairly common. We don't, the cafes that you might even see nowadays are not anything like the cafes that this poem would have referred to. Um, cafes before were, were quite elegant places, more like European cafes where, where you would actually sit and have something to eat, like a little a little sort of breakfast room type of place. And look at the bread, it's all nicely wrapped, it's all wrapped in, in plastic, it gets taken there by a van all safely, and it has a cook who, who does various things to it to, to make it all lovely and delicious. And that's contrasted with the other side of things, which it's just being eaten as is. It doesn't have anything additional on it, doesn't have any butter or marmalade, or and and it's just the bread on its own. Look at what's on the left hand side. There's there's butter and marmalade and a whole lot of other things. The food bedecked pre breakfast table. There's an air of plenty in that stanza, which is compared to the other stanza where all that this builder's got is he's basically sitting on the scaffold. I mean, he's eating where he works. He's not clean. He's eating it with his dirty hands, and he just has the bread and maybe a drink. But he doesn't actually seem that unhappy, but I'll, I'll come back to the tone a little bit later on. Look at the verb in that particular stanza there. That word mauls means to, to sort of eat something like an animal. You know, you just kind of grab it and eat it. It's not a, it's not a very genteel or civilized uh, verb, but that's deliberately to create this, the, the contrast between this very genteel breakfast table and this man just, you know, eating the bread with his you know, straight out of his hands. So that line there, man can live on bread alone, is the second biblical reference in the, the poem. The first one was in the first stanza when it talked to, it talked about Satan's cauldron. So you've got two biblical references here, and that might give us some indication of, of some of the meaning that you can talk about in the poem. So on the one hand, 
This poem could be about the fact that something like a loaf of bread can be so simple, uh, but it gets it ends up in two very different places. And so the poem could be commenting on the, the difference between the wealthy and the poor who are both eating this bread. That's, that's on a fairly elementary level. But on the other hand, you've got this reference to man shall not live on bread alone. Now in the poem it says man can live on bread alone, but the original biblical reference is man shall not live on bread alone. And it's been changed to man can live on bread alone. So this is probably where you would find some nuance in the interpretation of this poem. This is where things could be into could could go a number of different ways. So here's some possible interpretations. You choose the one that you think resonates most with you. And as always, ensure that if you do offer a particular interpretation for the poem, you substantiate it with reference to the poem. So the first possible reference is this idea that no matter who you are, we all draw our sustenance from nature. Both the rich and the poor are still deriving their, their, their food and their, and their source of sustenance from nature. Although the people are from different circumstances, they're actually all eating the same thing. So in that case, bread becomes a symbol of equality and is almost suggesting that in nature, everyone is equal. I mean, sure, there would be, there would be things that wealthier people would consume that um, less wealthy people would not consume, like maybe things like um, I don't know, sushi or, you know, fancy things like that. But everybody is, is eating the bread. And in that way, the bread is an equalizer. The second possible interpretation, and I'm not sure that any of these are mutually exclusive, by the way, I think that you could argue for any of them and, and possibly even together, is that it's just enough to just be happy with the simple things. If you look back to that last stanza, what does the laborer do? He's eating. I mean, can you picture that? He mauls the loaf of bread. He's got it in his hand and he's dirty and he like just tears it with his teeth, but he's not unhappy. He laughs. He laughs and he says, man can live on bread alone. So the tone of that last stanza seems to indicate that maybe it's, it's not a kind of a, a tragic political commentary about how poor he is. He seems quite happy to live on bread alone. And he says he can live on bread alone. That seems to suggest that the bread might be simple, but it's satisfying and that's enough. And is he saying that, is he contradicting what the Bible says? I mean, the Bible says man shall not live on bread alone. And the meaning of that line is that man needs more than just physical sustenance. Man needs spiritual sustenance as well. That's what the Bible line means, but it's been changed in this poem to man can live on bread alone. Does that mean it's suggesting that this man does not need God because he's got his bread? And then another possible meaning is, is as I referred to, uh, referred to before, this idea that it's, that it's indicating some level of inequality. It, it's possible that the last line is sarcastic or ironic. I mean, maybe what the person is saying is that he has no choice. He must live on bread alone. Although perhaps if the poet intended it to be that, he would have said, man must live on bread alone. What's the difference between can and must? I don't know, you can think about that. But that, that might be the suggestion that the, there's a deliberate contrast created between the two places where the bread ends up and the laborer in this case has no choice but to only eat bread. In this case, if you chose this particular interpretation, does that mean that the biblical reference there, the line man can live on bread alone, is indicating that a person in that man's circumstances doesn't have the luxury of being able to believe in anything else. He just has to take what he can get. Is it suggesting that God is perhaps a luxury and that the poor don't have the luxury of believing in him because they are just busy trying to get by? There's no answer to these questions. I'm just putting them out there as, a, as something for you to think about with regards to the poem and to, and to offer as, as potential interpretations.
So considering we started out with a nice simple poem about a loaf of bread, I managed to make it really complicated, didn't I? I've succeeded as an English teacher. So just in case that went by a little bit too quickly, let's just come back to the poem, at least the last two verses of the poem, and, and take a second look at them and see if we can pick up where that nuance is coming from. I want to point out the fact that if you look at the person eating the bread or the people that eat the bread, in this particular poem, there is actually only one person that we see eating the bread. Although you have in the, in the second stanza a reference to a, a food bedecked breakfast table and the, the food is all laid out there beautifully, we don't see anybody eating that bread. Who do we actually see in this poem? Who is represented? The laborer in the last stanza who's eating the bread, the cook who's preparing this breakfast, who's also actually a laborer. And in the first stanza, we have the reaper who's harvesting the, the wheat, who's also a laborer. So we've got three laborers in this poem. This is what the poem then becomes about. This is who is represented. Um, I've had to think about it a little bit and, and try to see what, what that might actually mean, but I'm going to leave it up to you to, to just make note of that and, and derive your own meaning from that. And hopefully if you end up with a question about that in the exam or if you are able to, you'll be able to take your understanding of this, this reference here to the fact that man can live on bread alone and these people, this, these mankind, these, these simple people living this simple life are living on, on bread alone. And that ultimately, I suppose, is what the poem ends up being about.